Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about the safety of new drugs for multidrug resistant tuberculosis. These are results from the NTB observational study. So as most of you would know, <coughs> excuse me, as you also heard from the film earlier, the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis is very difficult. So it's very long. Most patients require 20 months. <coughs> it's toxic, requiring a combination of drugs, and it's very difficult to achieve good results. So when betaquiline and delaminid, the first new TB drugs in 40 years, achieved conditional registration after phase 2B trials, it was really an opportunity to try to improve the treatment of MDR-TB. But there were safety concerns. Firstly, in the clinical trial of betaquiline, the betaquiline arm had more mortality than the control arm. Secondly, betaquiline and delaminid both increase the QT interval. The QT interval is measured on the ECG, and a prolong prolongation of this QT interval is a risk factor for torsade du point or ventricular fibrillation and sudden death. And there was very limited data about combining betaquiline and delaminid or combining these with other QT prolonging drugs. So, what's all the problem with safety and tolerability of MDR-TB regimens? So this table tries to show a little bit how challenging it is to give patients multiple TB drugs, and, and especially patients who have other comorbidities comorbidity and risk factors. So the first column lists some common adverse events. The second column lists TB drugs known to cause these adverse events. And the third column lists other factors which are high risk for the cause of these adverse events. So let's take the example of QT prolongation. So as well as betaquiline and, and delaminid, which cause QT prolongation, so do the fluoroquinolones, levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, and clofazamine. Both drugs used very regularly in MDR-TB. There are other intrinsic and extrinsic factors that also put a patient at risk for this adverse event. You can see that linzulid features very highly on this list. list. Linzulid can cause irreversible peripheral neuropathy. Cyclosarin and isoniazid can also cause, cause peripheral neuropathy. And there's many other contributing factors. In addition, linzulid can cause, cause optic neuritis and myelosuppression. We can also see that canamycin and capromycin, these are injectable drugs given through a painful intramuscular injection uh, daily for usually about eight months, can cause hearing loss, acute renal failure, and electrolyte depletion. Electrolyte depletion is especially important if you have QT prolongation. So our objective of this study was to assess the safety of MDR-TB regimens containing delaminid or betaquiline. Should be noted that the NTB observational study looks at effectiveness and safety, but I'm only talking about safety today. So this is a multi-center observational prospective study conducted by MSF, Partners in Health and uh, Interactive Research and Development, and it's funded by UNITAID. Consented patients to receive betaquiline or delaminid in an MDR-TB regimen according to WHO recommendations between April 2015 and June 2017 were included. 15 countries participated and you can see they're distributed widely across the globe. So patients were monitored closely for adverse events and safety data was collected. So what we did was we defined a, a predefined list of nine adverse events. We then defined at which clinically relevant severity level we would report these events. So any, any uh, severity level that we considered was clinically relevant was usually when we had to do some change to the TB treatment or in the case of electrolyte or um, hypothyroidism where we had to do a replacement. So for example, if we had electrolyte depletion, depletion we replace the electrolytes, we don't stop the TB drug. So on the left here, you have the list of these predefined nine adverse events on which we're going to report today. On the right-hand side, you have the severity level at, we, at which we considered them to be clinically relevant. So let's take the example of QT prolongation again. So 
if on the ECG, the QT, uh, QT interval corrected with the Fredericia formula was over 500 milliseconds, we consider this to be clinically relevant. If we take the example of anemia, if the hemoglobin was less than 7.9 grams per deciliter, we consider this to be clinically relevant. For hearing loss, we consider any hearing loss clinically relevant. So we're going to report on the number and frequency of patients who experience at least one clinically relevant adverse event. If a patient experienced more than once the same clinically relevant adverse event, it was only counted once. We're also going to report on the incidence of clinically relevant adverse events during the MDR-TB treatment containing betaquiline or delaminid from the start date of these drugs. And in addition, we'll report on the incidence of clinically relevant adverse events during exposure to a specific drug which formed part of the initial drug regimen with delaminid or betaquiline and only during the first exposure to this drug. So there are 1,244 patients included in this analysis. They are mostly males, and we can see that comorbidities such as HIV, diabetes, hepatitis C were common, and a third of the patients had a low BMI. This table shows also how these patients had very difficult forms of TB to treat. Most of them had been treated previously with MDR-TB treatment, making it extremely difficult to have a good result the second time. They had extensive disease, either bilateral legency non on chest X-ray or cavity disease. And over half of them had fluoroquinolone resistance, resistance to ofloxacin, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, a well-known risk factor for treatment failure in MDR. So as well as all patients receiving either betaquiline or delaminid, remember this is a multi-drug regimen, they receive at least five drugs, most patients. 42 patients had both betaquiline and delaminid. 82%, so most patients had linzulid. It was common to receive cycloserine, clofazamine, moxifloxacin or levofloxacin. And about half of the patients had one of the injectable drugs, canamycin or caprimycin. So here are the results. So the first column lists the adverse events of which now you're familiar. The second column has the uh, number of patients who experience at least once one of these adverse events at a clinically relevant severity level. The third column lists the median time to the first event and the th fourth column lists the incidence in 100 person months. So remember there was a lot of concern about QT prolongation. So actually, QT prolongation was very infrequent. Less than 3% of patients, remember they all received at least one QT prolonging drug, only less than 3% of patients had a QT interval that was more than 500 milliseconds. And the incidence was low at 0 0.18 per 100 person months. However, peripheral neuropathy was occurred in at least, in, in just under one quarter of the patients. Uh, with a high incidence of 1.96 per 100 person months. And it's interesting to look at the median time to the onset of these linzolid related adverse events. So this, as has been shown elsewhere in the literature, myelosuppression occurs in the first couple of months, then peripheral neuropathy occurs about four to five months, and then optic neuritis later. The most common was electrolyte depletion caused by canamycin and capriomycin, with over a quarter of the patients having at least one event of clinically relevant electrolyte depletion, with a very high incidence of 2.15. As well caused by the canamycin and capriomycin, hearing loss was very, very common. 17% of patients experienced this with a high incidence of 1.29. Now we look at the clinical relevance of the, uh, the clinically relevant adverse events whilst on a drug of interest, the drug of interest form part of the baseline uh, MDR-TB regimen. So we've already seen the QT prolongation since all patients were on betacrine and on delaminid, but just a reminder that it wasn't common. But if we look amongst the patients who started a regimen containing linzulid, 
and who, who experience at least one of either peripheral neuropathy, myelosuppression, or optic neuritis, 25%, and with a high incidence of 2.05 2 per 100 person months. Hearing loss was among, amongst patients who had canamycin and caproamycin in the baseline regimen, 20% experienced hearing loss with a very high incidence of 3.36. And if we look at any of the adverse events related to the injectable drugs, hearing loss, electrolyte depletion, or renal failure, 36% of patients who received canamycin or capromycin at baseline experienced one of these at a clinically relevant level, and the incidence was extremely high at 6.16. So after all that concern about QT prolongation, finally, we've shown that it was the least common of the, the clinically relevant adverse events despite all patients receiving at least betaquiline or delamonid, and most patients receiving at least one other QT prolonging drug, clofazamine or levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. However, we saw that peripheral neuropathy was really common. Luckily, most of them were low grade severity. We hope that means that clinicians were able to adjust the treatment or reduce the dose. Um, and 82% of patients received linzolid and also 70% cycloserine, and many patients had other risk factors, HIV, diabetes, excess alcohol or other drugs causing peripheral neuropathy. And it was a very high frequency of any of the linzolid-related adverse events during exposure. Hearing loss was very common, so 20% during exposure to the injectable drugs canamycin or capromycin. And it should be really noted that it's extremely hard to monitor. Uh, you need to do audiometry, and even a recent phase three clinical trial didn't manage to do audiometry in all of the patients. And so the reported frequencies in the literature vary between 1% and 60% and of patients. But what we do know that in these programmatic, programmatic conditions, it was very common, one fifth of patients. And also, it can't be forgotten that, that all the other adverse events caused by the, the canamycin, capromycin, electrolyte depletion is very important, especially in patients who may have QT prolongation. Uh, apart from the fact it's very painful. So we can conclude that MDR multi-drug regimens containing delaminid or betaquiline showed no major safety issues related to QT prolongation. But there are a lot of adverse events, and they're frequently associated with the other drugs in the regimen. So monitoring and management of those adverse events is, is really required. Audiometry and electrolytes for patients that are on the injectable drugs, canamycin and capriomycin, blood counts, peripheral neuropathy screen and visual acuity screen for patients on linzolid, and of course ECG. So this, this study has already contributed to the 2019 WHO guidelines. So WHO now recommends betaquiline as a first priority for all patients. So this is really good news, a very well tolerated drug as well as effective. And canaromycin and capriomycin, these very toxic, painful injections, are no longer used and only used as a last resort. So this is really great news for patients. And this, this uh, data will also contribu contribute to another guideline review that will happen this year, especially on the, the duration of betaquiline and combining betaquiline and delimited. But really now the work is to implement these less toxic, all oral, without those injectable regimens for all MDRTB patients, and that's not so easy. And whilst we're waiting for the results of our clinical trials and other clinical trials that are testing these, these new drugs in shorter regimens, we should be using shorter regimens with these new drugs under operational research conditions to contribute to the, 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 the data available on these. So thank you to everybody in the 15 countries and to the central analysis team. Thank you.